Thank you, Sue. And uh, what I'm going to talk about is um, big data and what we would call real world data and some of the issues around that. And from this, you understand why I refer to this as digital e-ethnography uh, in healthcare. And in healthcare in particular, big data is particularly challenging because we're highly regulated and uh, things like GDPR, for example, uh, is something that really we're implementing or has been implemented in healthcare for some time. Um, you know, it's kind of like water off the duck's back in terms of the constraints in uh, for personal identity data and things like this. So one of the things, if we have a look at, um, one of the things here is that uh, big data um, and is really, or old data sources were referred to as the data factories, the data houses. And one of the key questions I had from a marketeer some time ago when we start, first started talking about and looking at big data and real world, what I'd call real world data, is what's the difference between big data and small data? It's kind of a funny question, but actually is quite insightful. And uh, you can see that in uh, previously, we would think of big data as being uh, coming from IMS, I, I Quiver, Nielsen, et cetera, whereas small data tended to be more the kind of stuff that market researchers uh, would generate. And um, the pro one of the problems with this actual data is a little bit like driving forward whilst looking in the rear view mirror, which, where as opposed to real data or real world data, that's more predictive. It's more dynamic. It looks at the data in real time. And this is uh, an example of some of the new data sources that are available, which I would describe as real, way, real world data, because it's mostly observational. It's uh, although passive data, it's actual behavior or chatter in real time. And that's why I would describe this as ethnographic style of data. In healthcare, we're seeing a lot of uh, new data sources. There's public health data becoming available. Uh, National Health Service publish 400, 4 million rows of data each month. There's uh, patient medical record, consolidated aggregated data becoming available, not personal information, but consolidated from that. And now there's digital health data coming through from apps, which means that I would predict that traditional data from the likes of the data factories or data houses is going to be quickly replaced or can be used and given access to a lot more sources and a lot more information. This is an example here. This is a pharmacy group, a very traditional pharmacy group in the north, uh, a coal mining region you know, traditional Yorkshire tea, that type of thing. But they've got four, uh, 70 branches in a particular area, completely EPOST. But also they have uh, an of a online uh, uh, pharmacy and they have access to and uh, routes through 1,500 pharmacy shops via this, via this online pharmacy. And as you can imagine, there's a lot of data being collected via the online pharmacy and, uh, and supplies. So new tech is actually giving access ability to uh, companies and uh, researchers where there wouldn't normally be data uh, coming through. And here's an example actually using some of the data from this pharmacy group, uh, looking at the correlation between analgesics, uh, painkillers, cough and cold, hay fever, and pollen count uh, as well, where you can match up pollen count data from uh, online data sources or the spread of flu. For example, uh, earlier this year, we saw flu uh, start in uh, Australia, start to spread across into Europe and different countries, and then start to spread from London in, into the north. This meant that when we were, help, when we were developing a uh, radio ad, 
uh, or advertising about uh, buying and uh, flu uh, injections or hay fever products, they're able to predict the best time to actually promote it for this pharmacy, for pharmacy pharmacy group. And actually the data points that was available in this data was far greater than anything I'd actually seen previously in uh, data from data houses. Now we would, in, far, in certainly in pharma and healthcare, we describe real world data as data that we collect, for example, from patient trackers. So where uh, physicians are recording patient records in very uh, specific areas, where the data houses were not able or are not able to cover as well, but also in terms of surveys that are done in patient reported outcomes. Um, so this, one of the issues with this is that it takes a lot of time, but the the advantage to this type of real world data, a very manual process, if you like, although collected online, um, is it is predictive and it can capture the latest patients, the patients that are prescribed, so it can be dynamic information. But what's becoming more readily available is data published uh, online, and here you can see the National Health Service publish a lot of data and they do some levels of analysis on the data as you can see here, where you can see antidepressants. And the NHS, uh, actually, and each month they pub they're publishing four million rows of data each month across many different areas with different metrics, right, going right down to uh, postcodes. Although it is aggregated, it is consolidated data, it can be very useful, especially for big data type analysis. And this is an example of some analysis that was done in partnership with, with uh, the pharmacy group, Weldrix, and uh, uh, a company called Real World uh, Analytics, uh, which looks at the diabetes problem and the problem of undiagnosed diabetes. And as you know, it's a growing epidemic of diabetes, uh, 3.5 million people currently diagnosed uh, in 2016, uh, but there's an estimated 1.1 million believed to be undiagnosed, and that number appears to be growing, and is estimated to grow uh, in the future. Now, using that data from the pharmacy groups, or and pharmacy group, this pharmacy group and other pharmacy groups, and the National Health Service data, you can actually look at uh, patients who are currently prescribed with diabetes or any other condition, but also look at uh, the other risk factors. What else are they prescribed for? What are they diagnosed for? So in terms of hypertension, cholesterol, uh, heart stroke risk, and what are they being prescribed for, for these products, for these conditions as well. Now, looking at that data, so the awful lot of millions of bits of data and information. You can then, for example, in this case, look at patients not prescribed for diabetes, but they actually have these risk conditions, which means that those who have these conditions are highly likely to either be pre-diabetic or diabetic, which indicates patients who are potential target for a diagnosis. Uh, and indication. Now, if you take that data and then relate that to actual postcodes, you can actually see where the likelihood of uh, or higher percentage relative to the population uh, of diabetic people are likely to be currently undiagnosed or are for pre either pre-diabetic or, or currently diabetic. And this gives you a good indication of where uh, spend from the local health uh, authorities uh, could, be, could be focused. Uh, there are different health authority initiatives and you can see here, for example, uh, in London, uh, there has been diabetic health, health authority initiatives where they're actually incentivizing GPs and pharmacies to try to identify 
uh, diabetic patients. So it can give you a, a good depth of, of uh, information that can actually help um, health uh, going forward. But one of the questions we need to ask is, where has the patient actually gone? And GP and healthcare professionals and doctors for that matter. And reality is, is they now live online and offline. We all spend some of our time, or a lot of our time, online uh, via smartphones usually. And this has given rise to and why uh, services like online pharmacy, click and collect uh, prescriptions or click and collect uh, pharmaceutical product can grow. And also, more recently, there's uh, services like Q Doctor, which is an online doctor service where a, a, a patient can go to a pharmacy, book an appointment that same day, which one of the issues with the healthcare services is uh, getting appointments. In some GP areas, it takes up to two weeks to get an appointment. I'm sure you know this from your own experience. And uh, but actually get an appointment right away, have the actual uh, consultation in the pharmacy in a private area via a computer, and the advantage of the pharmacy is that they can take metrics such as blood pressure, etc., and also fulfill prescription at the same time. So a one-stop opportunity there, showing you a digital example. And this has given rise to a lot of companies uh, developing what's called patient support programs. So when they actually uh, prescribe a product, uh, some of the uh, pharmaceutical brands are able to support with offering a patient support program which gives a patient advice on uh, healthy living, eating, etc., exercise, uh, but also has things like reminders to take their, their pills. But the real uh, prize for the pharma companies in this is the, is the data collected. And patients that are signed up to these programs are willingly and through informed consent sharing their data. They're perhaps collecting metrics uh, such as uh, uh, blood analysis results or BP, blood pressure, etc. Um, and with these systems, it's, it could be possible to predict outcomes of the patients as their metrics change and as their disease or condition progresses over time, but also in uh, plan interventions to say, for example, you must see your doctor, uh, your blood pressure is such and such, et cetera, that type of thing, um, and, um, and then predict the, the, the future. Now, this is almost like a what we would describe as a real-world clinical study. Uh, the advantage to the pharma company with this is that if a patient is taking a particular product, they're able to show through this the outcomes that are possible, which is of course worth an awful lot to this market. Now this really patient support programs is kind of old news now, and this is all moving to apps, and uh, in, this, in this example here, this uh, pharmacy group are actually prescribing apps for patients when they come in to collect their prescription for a particular con for a particular condition. Um, and of course, um, you know, you can see that the apps are of course collecting data as well, which brings a point to the uh, Internet of Things where you've got things like Google Home, Amazon Alexa, which are also collecting data via these different digital assets. Uh, in, in the case, I believe, I've heard that uh, Google Home or Alexa collect, are actually sending data, or collecting data every three minutes. So when you're talking to that at home, it might actually be collecting the information and sharing that information. But that's passive data, but you may not be aware of that, which is one of the issues with all of this information. And here you can see an example of some of the hats. There's actually a turf war, really, on trying to engage patients in these apps. And there's an actual competition, really, between different apps that are available to patients. 
um, to, for their particular, but also styled for their particular condition. They'll have, for example, pill reminders, which is good for encouraging patients to adhere to their medication because you may or may not know that there's a high level of poor adherence. In, in fact, patients with quite critical conditions uh, or if they or don't have any symptoms are very well known to not stay on their medications when in fact if they come off the medications they could actually be doing some damage. But this leads me to what I would describe as and where we come in as market researchers where we can collect data in a safe environment uh, where the patient or the consumer has that informed consent. GDPR and personal identity issues are covered because within these apps and uh, Internet of Things like uh, Amazon Alexa, the patient, patients or consumers can be sharing data they may actually not be aware of, which brings to a key issue with with all of this information. But and but also there's a great opportunity here as well. So for example, both Fitbit and Apple Watch are seeing uh, atrial fibrillation, which is uh, a heartbeat, um, a random heartbeat effectively, or irregular heartbeat, uh, could be monitored um, by, uh, by uh, these apps. And here you can see actually uh, a Fitbit monitor of my heartbeat where I was jogging, it had gone up to 175. You can see how it, gone, it had gone up and up and down uh, over time, over that jogging time. Um, and effectively, you could have an alert or it could identify these watchers in the future, could potentially identify different heart conditions through this monitoring. And also, uh, in the future, mon they'll, they'll be able to actually monitor more, but again, they're collecting data. Now, big data is actually not really, it's not really new. Um, and this is me with, with hair, about 30 years ago, I think, um, where uh, I was working on IBM systems, some IBM systems. In fact, it was just myself as a young guy and one other, an IT guy, who had access to two giant IBM uh, systems, we would compete with each other to see if we could write a program to crash the system overnight. It was our, our game of fun, but it was actually, this was the, the indication with these IBM systems was the start of this. And uh, now IBM, looking at software and IBM uh, Watson, has progressed uh, somewhat going forward. Um, and uh, IBM Watson is capable of asking questions, potentially could diagnose patients uh, very effectively by asking standard diagnosis questions, but also using the big data that it has um, access to, and again, could potentially be predictive uh, in terms of how people progress and progress. John, we're running a little over time. So, yeah, okay, thank you. Okay, so, Going back to one of the issues with big data is that it's quite haphazard data. It could be, uh, uh, and one of the issues with GDPR, which begs the question with social listening. Um, and in healthcare, in particular, one of the issues with market research is what's the purpose of the data and the issue of secondary data. And if that data is being repurposed, did the patient or, the, or consumer know that that data was going to be used? So that's one of the issues that this brings up. And in a way, when we look at social listening, certainly in healthcare, we have to report adverse events. But social listening actually shows things like semantic analysis, which uh, would show negative uh, comments. So even say somebody was on a particular medication and they had a headache, if they were talking about that, that would effectively be a reverse, uh, an adverse event that would have to be reported. The question here is, are we blinkered uh, in looking at this data? It's one of the issues. One of the other issues with this is that big data and big IA machines are a bit like looking in 
a, a needle of haystack of a lot massive haphazard unuseful data uh, to find the actual information and here for example is big data starts off with random data then it's connected by bits of data but only comes down to quite a small amount of data uh, that's actually actually useful it's a quality of data uh, issue so for the future I predict that predictive analytics is where the future data is um, but with all of this data there's always a piece missing and in healthcare it's usually with uh, e-ethnography or ethnography and what the patients actually want and this is where qualitative data and actual listening to chat etc comes into itself but my final point just moving on uh, is really to say although we've got all this data and information uh, in healthcare we mustn't forget that these are real people at the end of your data and uh, they're all they're looking for forward to is becoming better coming uh, uh, and, and uh, helping with their, their condition. Over to you, Sue. Thank you.